Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Vegan Spirituality Online Gathering. This is part of In Defense of Animals Sustainable Activism Campaign, and my name is Lisa Levinson. I'm one of your co-hosts today, and I'm the director of this Sustainable Activism Campaign, and what we do is we bring a, a spiritual and emotional resources to animal activists and to other folks who really connect with veganism as part of their spiritual path. So this is a, a really wonderful opportunity for all of us to get together and to connect across the miles. And my co-host is Judy Carmen, and she'll be speaking with you in a moment. Mm -hmm. And we have a very special guest with us today, uh, Richard Swartz, who you can see online. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're online with us, you can see all of us in the, <laughs> in the little webcam there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judy will introduce Richard shortly. So I just wanted to welcome everyone. This is really an, an event, it's a gathering. So all of us are together in an effort to explore veganism as a spiritual practice. So thank you very much for joining us today. And a couple little announcements. So we do have a vegan spirituality retreat coming up. I wanted to let you know because we're in the process of planning it. It's really exciting. And it will be uh, next April at Jungle Friends Primate Sanctuary. So we're just putting together all of our promotional materials. Wanted to let you know it'll be a fun day, a whole day retreat with Ray Sakura as our speaker. And we'll also have a volunteer day where we get to um, hang out with the primates and really help the Jungle Friends Sanctuary. So I hope you guys can stay tuned for that. And we do offer, uh, for those people who would like a one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection and have an opportunity to uh, talk with some of our helpline counselors, we have a sustainable activism. Uh, one of our features of that program is a helpline for activists. So we hope that this can be used by anybody who's listening in today. And the number is 1-800-705-0425. And if you're having a conflict with uh, people at your uh, place of worship, you can call that and that number and talk to someone about it who really understands, someone who's vegan and who really gets the vegan message of compassion. So you can also tune in to other events, online events that we have. We have a sustainable activism webinar that's uh, once a month, and the next one will be in the beginning of July. And also, we hope to see you at the Animal Rights Conference, those people who are going to be in Los Angeles July 7th through 10th. We have a really special uh, initiative that we're putting together, Judy I, and I, and also um, Thomas Jackson from the Compassion Project, we're putting together a coalition of uh, spiritual and religious leaders to uh, use the Compassion Project, that um, new uh, documentary, as a tool to really reach out to uh, spiritual and religious leaders across the country and encourage them to go vegan. So if this is something of interest to you, please let us know either in the chat box today or um, online. We'll be posting and announcing more about this, but we will be meeting in person at the Animal Rights Conference on Friday at 6 p.m. We'll be meeting and sharing, sharing a meal together while we start to uh, launch this initiative to really encourage these places of worship to, to uh, honor compassion for all living beings by promoting veganism. So a very exciting project underway. And just wanted to let you know that Vegan Spirituality, this online gathering, also has sister communities that meet across the country. And these meet in person. They're in all different states. And if you want any more information or would like to start a community of your own, um, you can do so by visiting veganspirituality.com. So that resource is available to you. And also to let you know that I'm handling a lot of the tech issues and the technical side of this call today. So if you have any concerns or any questions, feel free to write them in the chat box if you are online with us. But if you're in the, on the phone, um, you can also, uh, there'll be an opportunity to do question and answers later in the call. And at that time, you can also join into the conversation. So thanks to everyone for joining us, everyone who's online and everyone on the phone. I'm going to read a little bit about Richard so everyone knows who he is, in case you don't already, aren't already familiar with his work. So Richard Schwartz is the author of Judaism and Vegetarianism, Judaism and Global Survival. Also, uh, Who Stole My Religion? Revitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal Our Imperiled Planet 
and Mathematics and Global Survival, and over 200 articles and 25 podcasts at jewishveg.com slash short. He is President Emeritus of Jewish Veg, formerly known as Jewish Vegetarians of North America, which is JVNA, and President of the Society of Ethical and Religious Vegetarians. In 1987, he was selected as Jewish Vegetarian of the Year by JVNA. In 2005, he was inaugurated into the North American Vegetarian Society's Hall of Fame. He is a patron of the International Jewish Vegetarian Society and on the board of directors of the Farm Animal Rights Movement, FARM, which hosts the Animal Rights Conference that we just mentioned. So thank you very much for joining us, Richard. <clears throat> Well, thank you for the very kind introduction, and uh, I'm going to salute uh, you uh, for the wonderful work within the Defense of Animals, and salute Judy for the, such a long time uh, activist with such wonderful books, and wish you much continued success. Oh, thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. One of the first questions I'd like to ask you, Richard, is mm -hmm. why did you write the book, Who Stole My Religion? What inspired you? Okay, actually, I wrote Who Stole My Religion, Revitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal Our Imperial Planet, because the world is so imperiled today that unfortunately we're heading toward a climate catastrophe, many other environmental threats, and it's essential that, among other things, many things have to be done. It has to become a number one issue if we want a decent world for future generations. And among the many things, the very important things, we have to really have a major shift toward vegan diets. It's a thing that you and Judy have been working on for so many years. And another thing I want to stress in this book is that Judaism, like other religions, has very powerful teachings on peace and justice and compassion, environmental sustainability, and unfortunately, they're not being applied enough, so it's essential that uh, Judaism and other religions apply these values to move our imperial planet onto a sustainable path. Awesome. Sounds like a really important reason to do this, to set, get this book out there into the world. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So just to, to kind of go on with that is, um, do you think the world is really approaching a climate catastrophe? And how do you respond to climate change skeptics, those folks who really just don't believe that it's happening? Um, and also, is, is there still time to avert a climate catastrophe? OK. The reason I'm so involved and so pretty much certain about this is that there's such a strong and unbelievable consensus. Just last December in Paris at a climate conference, and this is an amazing thing, when you realize, look, think of the Democrats, Republicans, all the arguments they have, and yet 195 nations, about all the nations of the world, all got together and agreed climate change is a threat. And we have to take steps to uh, make sure we do avert a climate catastrophe. In addition, 97% of the climate experts, and even more important, 99.9% .9 of the peer-reviewed articles in respected mm -hmm. science journals all agree, all the major science academies agree. And uh, you could spend a whole hour in this time, but I'll try to be brief. I love the animal there. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> This is amazing how the world's heating up. An amazing fact, the 12 months from May 2015 to April 2016, all 12 consecutive months broke temperature records for the world. And 2015 mm, was a one-year, wow. broke the record set just the year before in 2014. And 2016 is on track to be even warmer. The 17 warmest years since 1880 when temperature records were first kept uh, all occurred since 1998, so just about every year in this century has been up there. And this has been causing the melting of the polar ice caps and glaciers all over the world. Severe climate events we see it almost every day. Uh, heat waves, droughts, wildfires, all kinds of storms and floods. And just to give one example, in California, there's been so many severe climate events that their governor, Jerry Brown, stated that humanity 
is on a collision course with nature. So this is really mm. the issue, an existential threat to the whole world, and uh, we've got to do everything possible to, uh, you know, make sure that we effectively respond to climate change. Wow. So you're knee deep in this. You're sounds like you're super aware of all of the um, the po politicians and those folks who who are making big strides and changes. Right. By the way, the other two parts of your question, um, the replying to skeptics, you know, like giving those data, that should be enough. In addition to that, uh, very often the skeptics or deniers are conservatives who think terrorism is a major threat, really. And of course, that is an extremely serious problem. But the U.S. Pentagon, the Defense Department, military experts all over the world feel that climate change can be a catalyst, a multiplier effect for instability, violence, terrorism, and war. Of course, very, very unfortunately, you're going to have tens, if not hundreds of millions of desperate fleeing refugees fleeing from the uh, many severe weather effects. And as to do we have enough time, unfortunately, it's very hard to be optimistic today. But one of the things we've been talking about mm. is due to an increase of slightly under one degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, mm. the experts hope, hope <clears throat> we can limit the total increase, including that one degree, to two degrees Celsius, primarily because we still have a chance for that happening. But unfortunately, we are on track for four or five or about well, six degrees Celsius, which would mean a, comp a really an unlivable world. So this mm. still time, but it's time is getting short. As I said, this has to be the number one priority. And I hope all the listeners involved will make it a priority and do everything possible to increase awareness of the threats <clears throat> and how important shifts to vegan diets are to the solution. Can you hear me now, Lisa? Oh, yes, yes we can, Jerry. Uh -huh. oh, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you Welcome so much. Back. This is wonderful. I'm very glad that you've joined us. Um, welcome back. <laughs> yes, welcome back. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll just, shall I just go on with the questions, Lisa? Thank you for taking over right. for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, no problem, no problem. So, Richard, um, you argue that Jews should be vegan. Um, do these arguments apply to other religions, and why uh, should Jews be vegan? Okay, it definitely applies to other religions because every religion is based on compassion and justice and environmental sustainability. They all come at it from different directions mm -hmm. in the world, which is fine. But uh, they apply. So why should Jews be vegans and everybody else for that matter? Well, the ideal Jewish diet is really the vegan diet because this is the one that God gave. It's in the very first chapter in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, uh, regards to about the herbs and the fruits and seeds, etc. So that ideal time, the Garden of Eden, and also the Messianic period that Jews yearn for also is pictured as going to be a vegan diet, and that is the view of Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of Free State Israel and many other scholars, and they based that on the powerful prophecy of Isaiah that in that ideal time, the wolf will draw the lamb, the lion will withdraw the ox, no one shall hurt nor destroy in God's holy mountain. But also, uh, you know, there's much in the Bible and uh, people can make cases in different directions, but there are six very important Jewish teachings that all point to veganism as a diet that Jews should have, and again, people of other religions and even secular people. So six important teachings or mandates, and these are to take care of our health, Treat animals with compassion. Oops. Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> Lost the picture from it. Okay. To treat animals with compassion. To be co-workers with God in protecting the environment. To conserve natural resources. To help hungry people and to seek and pursue peace. And these are all basic to Judaism, other religions, and I'll be happy to uh, discuss them further. 
So, so they're based in the concept of nonviolence, compassion, caring for the earth, uh, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. So, Taking care of our health, so, helping the hungry. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Right. All those things, yeah. So how can we as activists approach Jewish people and, and other people of faith with this message? And and what has your experience been? Okay, well, we have to be very respectful always, but I think we have to be far more aggressive. You know, rabbis, ministers, priests, imams, they're all very dedicated people. They're, they're steeped in their religion, but unfortunately, uh, a certain amount of denial. You've probably all heard the expression, denial is not just a river in Egypt. And uh, unfortunately, many people are in effect rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as we head toward that a giant iceberg, that climate catastrophe we've been talking about. So actually to go to your religious leader and mention, look, our religion is based on compassion. How can we have uh, or ignore the tremendously negative way that animals are raised? God would want us to be healthy. How can we have a diet that's been linked to heart disease, cancer, other chronic degenerative diseases? Uh, Every religion cares for the poor, the hungry. The amazing thing is that animal-based diets uh, require that in the U.S., for example, 70% of the grain produced here in the U.S. is fed to animals destined to slaughter while millions of people are dying of hunger and almost a billion of the world's Mm -hmm. people are chronically malnourished. So we have a case, by the way, uh, very kind before the introduction and mentioning I have over 200 articles at jewishveg.com and a slash my last name, Schwartz. And one of them is a fictitious dialogue between a Jewish vegetarian or vegan activist and a rabbi. And I uh, hope people will take a look at that because we have truth, morality, justice, and all the virtues on our side. So we have to try to engage in respectful dialogues. And I think changes are happening, by the way. I think more and more religious leaders, you know, many rabbis are moving toward vegetarianism and veganism. So we've got to just make the case. And also at a time when I say, the experts say that we're heading toward this climate catastrophe, the fact that animal-based agriculture is a major, major contributor, major emitter of greenhouse Mm -hmm. gases, largely because of methane given off by cattle. And methane is from 72 to 100 times more potent in heating the atmosphere per unit weight than carbon dioxide is. So we've got this case, you go to your local religious leader and just say, uh, we're not trying to change religion, we're trying to apply the highest religious values. Uh, can we get together with a group and maybe organize a class on it? Maybe you'd like to give a sermon on it? You know, we've mm-hmm. just got to get this out into the mainstream. Yeah, like a a book study, we can um, buy your books for people and have a book study at the the synagogue or the church, something like that. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like a lot of it is... What? I missed that. No, I'm saying it would be wonderful if people had used it for discussion because it's it's very respectful Mm -hmm. and all, and uh, it has tries to make a very powerful case that Jews and everybody else should be vegans, should be animal activists, because uh, Judaism, my God's religion, has very powerful teachings on compassion to uh, animals and should be environmental activists. And just to reinforce that idea, the powerful teachings on compassion, Jews are supposed to be Rachmanim, B'nai Rachmanim, means compassionate children of compassionate ancestors. We're supposed to emulate a God whose compassion is over all God's works, as indicated in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 145, verse 9. And again, many teachings, it's part of the Ten Commandments, which indicates not only are people to rest on the Sabbath day, but animals as well. A Jew is not supposed to sit down to a meal until making sure his pet or farm animal has been fed, for example. Uh, according to the Torah, you can't yoke uh-huh. a strong and weak animal. You can't muzzle the ox while threshing in the field. So 
many, many teachings on compassion for animals. And it's just so contrary, as you super well know, with what happens on factory farms where animals right. are so cruelly, cruelly treated. So what we have to do mm -hmm. is say, in effect, if you look at the religious teachings on one side, whether it be in terms of compassion for animals, taking care of our health, helping the hungry, protecting our very imperiled planet, serving natural resources, and you look at the realities, they're so far apart, and you can say, and I've been arguing, that animal-based diet, it's really, it's, it's madness and sheer insanity when you realize the negative mm -hmm. health effects, and in addition to the, the fact that we're feeding very healthy foods to animals, corn and oats and soy, which are devoid of cholesterol and saturated fat, very high in fiber and complex carbohydrates. We feed them to animals, we get meat out of it, which is just the opposite, very unhealthy, causing those diseases. Right. And there's so many other issues, like the world is becoming very short on water. The uh, aquifers right. are shrinking, glaciers are melting, it's becoming a big, big issue. And yet it takes 13 or 14 times as much water per person on a person on an animal-based diet than on a, and for a person on a vegan diet. So it's really madness and sheer insanity. And if we want a decent world for our children, grandchildren, there's really got to be a major shift toward vegan diets in addition to the other many positive things that should be done. Yeah, and it, and the time is now. And that's why you yeah, absolutely. this book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my other um, reason. Yeah. One Jewish teaching says, if not now, when? So, absolutely. Yeah, it's already yeah. something too late. We've got to start as soon as possible and really make a major, major push because religion can have such an impact. It's had an impact in the past on civil rights issues with Martin Luther King and others, and it has to play a leading <laughs> role in uh, the environmental issues and climate change among others. The, really a spiritual um, work in many ways, and especially because so many religions have compassion as a basic value and need to return to that. So <clears throat> what has the response uh, been from the Jewish community to your teaching? Okay. You know, when a question like that occurs, I'm reminded of a story of a rabbi that leaves and tells his wife, I'm going to give a sermon on, about how the wealthy should give more money to the poor. And then he returns, the wife said, well, how did the talk go? He said, well, I'm halfway there. The poor are willing to accept the money. So that reminds me because the people who are sympathetic really like the message, you know, the fact we're giving them ammunition, but again, as I said before, denial is not just a river in Egypt. People want to ignore it. The Jewish vegetarians made a wonderful video, by the way, called A Sacred Duty, Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal the World. And it's relatively mild even in showing how terrible things are for animals and factory farms, but people just don't want to see it. There's a need to break mm -hmm. through. You know, people are creatures of habit. Their parents ate meat, their grandparents, and this is what they know. So somehow it's difficult. We have to break through. And the fact is that many people are committed to their religions, but they're ignoring these basic, basic teachings in all the religions about compassion and about being co-workers with God and preserving the environment. In chapter 2 mm -hmm. of Genesis, right near the beginning, says that the human being was put in the Garden of Eden to work the land, but also to guard it. So we are to be like mm -hmm. co-workers, guardians of the earth. And by the way, there are teachings that are misinterpreted. Like in the very first chapter, it talks about God giving people dominion. But the Jewish sages interpret that as responsible stewardship, or responsible guardianship, mm -hmm. and not, not the carte blanche to do whatever we want. And it does say in the first chapter also that only human beings were created in God's image. 
But that too, taken the right way, could mean we should emulate God, being created in God's image. And just as God is compassionate and is concerned about animals, we should be as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And isn't there um, in the in Genesis of the Nefesh Chaya, I think it is, that animals have souls as well as yeah. people? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Nefesh Chaya, yeah. that uh, human beings as well as animals have a living soul. God has made covenants with animals as well as people. Right. And uh, again, very strong, strong teachings. In addition to everything else, it's a test for leadership because perhaps the greatest Jewish hero, Moses, who led the Israelis out of Egypt, was chosen because as a child, as a shepherd, he, he showed great compassion for animals. Also, another one of the great Jewish leaders, King David, also, according to the Jewish tradition, was chosen because he showed compassion to animals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of these things are in your writing that we can find online because we don't, Absolutely. you know, a lot of us need need extra information that you have <laughs> and uh, well, we all do. that we can share with people. Mm-hmm. So, well, absolutely. I hope so what is the, the people... Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. What is the best website to go to to find, uh, like, the 200 articles and the podcast and right. all that? Okay. They can go to one word, Jewish, followed by the first three letters of vegan. So it's Jewish, jewishveg.com, and then a slash, and my last name, Schwartz, S C H. W-A-R-T-Z, the 200 articles in all aspects of things. A lot of okay. the articles are tips about being activists. And I also have articles relating all the Jewish holidays to veganism because there's many powerful teachings. And again, we have to put them into practice and challenge the religious establishment very respectfully and say, again, uh, we're not trying to char- start a new religion, but we're trying to put the highest values of our religion into practice. Uh, you know, what good is it mm-hmm. to have wonderful, wonderful teachings on compassion for animals if right next door, in effect, the animals are so being so mistreated and people mm-hmm. want to be blind to that, want to ignore it, but uh, these are the realities. And uh, every morning in the Jewish prayers, it says, Baruch Murachim al Haaretz, Baruch Murachim al Habriot. Blessed is the one, meaning God, who has compassion on the, on the world, the earth, and has compassion on the animals every single day. So, once again, it's a very powerful Jewish teaching and probably in other religions that we are to imitate God's traits of compassion, justice, and kindness, etc. Mm hmm. So that is a prayer that you say every morning, and yeah, that is most that's Jewish part people, of it. Yeah, so they're already saying it. They're already <laughs> well, <but> not <laughs> not, not every Jewish person. Yeah, well, that's the <laughs> that's the important thing that we shouldn't have. What Abraham Joshua Heschel, my favorite rabbi, indicated is religious behaviorism, which is doing the ritual without thinking and putting it to practice. Uh, like other religions, mm-hmm. Ju- Judaism has particular aspects, like a business, keeping kosher, but it also has very powerful universal messages. Seek peace and pursue it. Justice, justice, shalt thou pursue. Be kind to the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That's the lesson of our slavery. And that is so important that it occurs more than any other verse, 36 times in the Jewish scriptures. And that led one rabbi to say that Judaism has a special kind of justice she called empathic justice, which takes into account the soul of the stranger in effect. And so we have many teachings like that, love thy neighbor as thyself. If I'm not for myself, mm-hmm. who will be? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? And following up on those statements by Hillel, famous Jewish sage, said, if not now, when? As you point out, we don't have much time. You know, the longer we wait, yeah. the more difficult it will become. 
Well, and it seems that we need to reach out to the the, uh, religious leaders because they can influence so many people at once. Of course, absolutely. uh, Yeah, yeah. So what you're doing is so important. Right. I just want to point out, by the way, we have a Jewish vegetarian group as uh, Lisa mentioned, Ms. Jackson called Jewish Veg, former Jewish Vegetarians of North America, under new dynamic leadership of Jeffrey Cohan, and uh, it's become a very yeah. professional group. We have a website, and we have a pledge campaign where people can pledge to go vegan for a short time, a longer period. We're building up our membership, and we have a wonderful rabbinic uh, advisory group and just a general advisory group. So. I hope people will join that group, or there's a Christian Vegetarian Association, wonderful work. Again, as mentioned in the Mm -hmm. the introduction, president of the Society of Ethical and Religious Vegetarians, which is an interfaith, interreligious group. So I hope people will take advantage Mm -hmm. of these, and of course, the many secular groups like the Farm Animal Reform Movement. It's a wonderful um, in defense of animals that Lisa is doing such a wonderful job with. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much we can do, but if we can get into the churches and the synagogues and the temples and all those places and reach Absolutely. these people, uh, and especially the leaders, who if they will, you know, get what we're saying, it will be huge. And as you said, there's not much time, and so this may be one of the best ways to get people to go vegan quickly because there isn't a lot of time. So Absolutely. what advice, Richard, what mm-hmm. advice do you have for us, um, all of us? One of the things we face is bearing witness to the terrible cruelty to animals. It's, it's difficult, and it's one of the things I that Defensive Animals has been addressing is helping people stay strong and vegan spirituality. Lisa's group is trying to do that as well to give people a a feeling of community, a spiritual community, um, because many people have left churches for the very Mm -hmm. reason that they they don't address animal cruelty. And so what advice do you have to help us stay strong in the face of all this and to go back into the churches and um, the places of faith and and start talking again. Right. Okay, well, one of the most important things, I think, is to recognize how serious the threats are to all of humanity. I mean, uh, just think in the last three, four weeks maybe, the temperature in India reached 124 degrees almost, mm. and the roads mm-hmm. were melting. Yeah. Think of that tremendous wildfire in Canada, unbelievably strong. Uh, you know, we hear about records being set all the time. Think of the flooding that's been going on in Texas recently, and much of Europe. I know in France they've had tremendous flooding. So a lot of people say, you know, maybe in my grandchildren's time, it'll be a problem. It's happening right now and uh, tremendously serious. So to recognize that, recognize everybody who, you know, I see young people getting married, having young children, wonderful, wonderful. But what kind of world are they going to have unless right away, as soon as possible, Mm -hmm. we make a change? And we have such powerful arguments. I mean, uh, the Bible uh, is very strong in terms of environmental sustainability, and there's a uh, Sabbath, the sabbatical year, the Jubilee year, all things that can help the environment. There's one other very important Jewish teaching, by the way, that can make a difference. In Hebrew, it's called Baal Tashkit, and it's based on not destroying or wasting, and it's based on a verse in Deuteronomy, actually chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, which says that even in time of warfare, you can't destroy fruit-bearing trees 
to build a battering ram to try and destroy an enemy fortification. And the Jewish sages took that special rule. In fact, you can't use an ax on trees in wartime. And they generalized it and said, if it's true in wartime, it should be even more true in you know regular times. And they made a general prohibition. And imagine if the world took this seriously, that we should conserve, not waste, not destroy. So we have the teachings. So I urge everybody to write letters, speak to your neighbors, your relatives, your friends, your co-workers, write articles if you can. Feel free to steal my 200 articles, build on them. Uh, as you know, it's much, much easier to be a vegan nowadays than 20, 30 years ago. There's yeah. so many more vegan restaurants, so many more vegan items, even in supermarkets. So it's far, far easier and, of course, certainly far healthier. And we have found health-wise that, you know, according to Dr. Dean Ornish, you can actually reverse heart disease. You can reverse certain kinds of right. other chronic degenerative diseases. So. We've got the case. People can go online and get all kinds of information and uh, you know, recognize that each one of us has to be a spokesperson for a better, more decent world, environmentally sustainable world. Because if we don't, uh, I'd hate to think what the future is going to be like, very unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You, you know, um, I'm seeing people making comments and asking questions, um, and it's, it's about 20 till. I'm thinking maybe we should open up for questions and comments. Richard, did you want to say anything else um, summarizing or anything mm. like that okay. before we open okay. it up? Okay, right. Well, I'll be happy to take questions. And by the way, if people want more information, I hope they'll consider emailing me at veggie, B-E-G-G-I-E, -E, rich, since I'm Richard, at gmail.com or go to my website. Well, just in summary, we've said it all, I think. The world's in tremendous trouble. Climate change is such a threat agreed to by overwhelming number of science experts. And thankfully, we have ways, thankfully, progress has been made moving to solar and wind, but change to a vegan diet can make a tremendous difference. And many studies have shown, one of them indicated that animal-based agriculture actually emits more greenhouse gases than is emitted by all the cars, trains, mm -hmm. all the means of transportation worldwide combined. So please, everybody, get involved, contact me, I'll be happy to work with people, and I'm ready for some tough questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so thank you, email, Richard. The, I wanted to. I posted the email. The email is veggierich at gmail dot com. Oh, I see. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd like to take a moment and just mention that that Richard, one of the things that you did, we have a Facebook event for for this um, gathering. Uh, just the one that was specifically with Richard, and he posted about nine or ten um, uh, Jewish um, values or words that related to concepts uh, from from the Jewish religion, and they were really well described in there. So I wanted to let folks know here that I'll go ahead and, and copy and paste those concepts into the email, and I'll send also a little list of the um, the veg uh, religious organizations into an email that goes out to all the people who uh, have registered for this event today, so that you can you can read them a little bit later. You can also go to the event page for for this uh, event, which is on the Vegan Spirituality Community Facebook page. So I just wanted to to let you know that those resources is, are there, and also. What we'd like to do is shift into a question and answer mode. I know that there's a couple that I've noticed in the chat box, so we could start off with those. And then what I'll do is change the format into uh, what's called Q&A, where if you would like to ask a question, you can um, unmute yourself and, and do so. So first, just wanted to address one of the questions that uh, came up that was about um, 
really how to respond to others when people say God gave us dominion over the animals. How do we respond to that? Well, as I indicated before, the Jewish sages interpret that dominion as responsible stewardship. I use the analogy that if a person has a nice big garden but doesn't have the time or the ability to take care of it, he might hire a gardener. In effect, he's given that gardener dominion because the gardener has the expertise, knows what to do, but certainly he's not giving that gardener carte blanche to say, if you just feel like cutting down a tree to, today or tomorrow, feel free to do it or anything like that. That gardener is a steward and is to, to fertilize when necessary, to put down other, well, hopefully minimize chemicals and stuff, but uh, do whatever is necessary to keep that garden as healthy as possible. And the same thing that the human beings uh, are given uh, that responsibility. By the way, right after dominion, which is chapter 1, I think verse 27 in Genesis, right after that, God's first dietary regimen is given in chapter 1, verse 29. So certainly that limits that dominion. And then, as I indicated, the very next chapter, chapter 2, verse 15, indicates our role partly is to be protectors or guardians of the earth. So <laughs> those are the answers I would give. Thank you, Richard. And another another question was related to um, uh, that that taking from the animals uh, products from them that are actually meant for their own well-being, like milk or eggs or honey, for example, um, is that considered? Uh, would that be considered stealing? Which is, um, is and is that one of the commandments? Okay, well, the um, commandment is that we should be compassionate to animals, again, imitating God, and we're supposed to be compassionate children of compassionate ancestors. And as you know, by the way, the uh, uh, first chief rabbi of pre-state Israel, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook, specifically said that taking the milk from a cow is really stealing. And as you well know, unfortunately, the way that dairy cows are raised, egg-laying hens are raised, uh, are really perhaps the worst examples of uh, mistreatment of animals. So that, I mean, the general category is that we should not mistreat animals. There's a Hebrew, beautiful Hebrew phrase called tzah balei chayim, which refers to the, uh, the pain of living creatures, and that has been interpreted as that we should not cause any certainly unnecessary pain to animals and certainly that is violated every second every minute every hour every day on the factory farms when we realize the unbelievable cruelty as you know things are changing in the positive direction but egg laying hens being in cages so small that they can't even raise a wing and instead of improving things unless they tend their natural pecking is swatted, so they often peck at each other, harm other chickens. So what do they do? They de-beak them, a very cruel, painful process. And uh, so that certainly is contrary to Jewish teachings about compassion for animals. And of course, since uh, the male chicks cannot lay eggs and haven't been genetically programmed to have much flesh, they are just disposed of, killed right away in very cruel ways. So. Uh, the way that animals are raised today in factory farms, for example, and well, almost all the animals raised for food are very contrary to basic Jewish teachings. Hmm. So, thank so you, Richard. Stealing it, honey would stealing honey would sit in there, right? Yeah, absolutely, because of yeah. the the ways that again there's <laughs> very negative effects. And as you know, thankfully, thankfully, there are many very good substitutes. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy almond milk, the right. soy and rice milks and all, substitutes for eggs and very sweet substitutes for honey. So a person is not mm -hmm. deprived at all and they're eating far healthier foods. Eggs, as you know, is super high in cholesterol, for example, and that milk dairy milk from cows that was designed of course for the baby calf 
to raise that calf, I think it's 300 pounds, uh, like 2,500 pounds in a very short period of time. So that is right. definitely not humans and causing all kinds of digestive problems. And as you know, many people are lactose intolerant. So it was not really meant for human beings. Right. Mm. Well, um, yeah, there was I, a I'm question. wondering, there's a question. There. Uh, yeah, I wanted to address one, and it's, it's um, okay, I'm going to try to say this. Hopefully I'll say it correctly. It's Nahorian Covenant. Have you heard of that, Richard? That's it's one a with God Noah, granting of permission. Oh. Yeah, Noah. Oh, Noah. Yeah, chapter 9, verse yeah, 3. Noah. After the big, big flood uh, that happened, yeah. So the thing is on that, I always say that Jews have a choice and others as well. I can't say it's forbidden to eat meat, although you can make a strong case that it, eating of meat violates so many Jewish commandments that you could argue that it should be forbidden. But anyway, uh, the Jews have a choice and the fact that Chief rabbis, who of course are very knowledgeable in Judaism, have been vegetarians and even vegans, shows that choice. So the important thing is we have a choice, but shouldn't that choice be made considering the highest of Jewish values and for others the highest of their religion values? The fact that animal-based diets violate, as I've said, Jewish teachings on taking care of our health, treating animals with compassion, uh, protecting the environment, conserving natural resources, helping hungry people, seeking and pursuing peace should make anybody who takes Judaism or other religions seriously be vegans. And the thing is, mm -hmm. would God want us to have a diet so bad for our health that is so tremendously harmful to animals, that is so uh, negative to the environment, that waste, God has given us an abundance of resources and all, and we should, of course, have to use them, but it's such a wasteful way. Animal-based diets waste land and energy and water and grain, et cetera. So God would not want us to have such a diet, and also that involves the feeding of so much grain to animals while people, or so many people are starving, and also uh, makes war more likely, because as the sages indicated, the Hebrew word for bread, which is lechem, and war milchama, come from the same root. The sages deducted that uh, when there's a shortage of grain and other resources, people are more likely to go to war. And unfortunately, history has borne that out. And this is why, by the way, if you pardon a little bit of a pun, I've been arguing that the slogan of the vegetarian or vegan movement and the slogan of the peace movement should be one and the same. And that comes from the John Lennon song. All we're saying is give peas a chance. Spoken <laughs> yeah. to the people. <laughs> uh -oh. Thanks, Thank Richard. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> so there's a couple, couple other questions here. And then, um, so one, one is, how do we engage religion in mass for the stewardship of the earth? This question is from Frank Lane. How do we do that for masses I'm sorry, of, of religion? Repeat that question. How do we engage? Oh, the question is, how do we engage religion in mass, meaning all religions, um, for the stewardship of the earth? How do we entice uh, our religious leaders to, to do that? So how do we get people involved and how to get them to take religion seriously, et cetera? Well, I hope by having some respectful conversation, by pointing out again that we are not trying to establish a new religion, but we're trying to say these values are beautiful. Let's put them into practice. You know, it's not uh, many people argue that uh, animal rights groups are negative on religion and uh, et cetera, but it's not uh, that Jews and others should be. Uh, animal rights activists, vegans, environmental activists, because of the uh, messages of animal rights groups, but because their very religions have these strong teachings and we should put them into practice. Otherwise, it's religious behaviorism, going through the ritual, 
without putting the, the essential thing that God is concerned about the environment. Right at the beginning, there's something called a midrash or a commentary on the Torah that says that when God created the world, he took Adam, the first human being, to see the trees in the Garden of Eden, the beauties of creation. And God said to Adam, do not despoil or destroy this world, since he was the only human being at the beginning, with Eve, of course. And do not despoil and destroy this world, because if you do, there will nobody, be nobody after you to restore it. And unfortunately, that teaching has become all too relevant today, where it seems, unfortunately, that human beings do have the capacity to destroy the world. Yeah. Sure do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one one question that came up in our chat box is also when these commandments are broken um, in the Jewish tradition, um, are do people go to hell or is there some other? <laughs> you know what what exactly happens? Okay, well, uh, or some other concept of punishment. Uh, Judaism is concerned more on this world rather than the world to come, and uh, that, you know there is a concept of punishment and all. It does say, by the way, in one of the most important Jewish prayers of Shema, that if we obey God's commandments, that we'll be given rain at the proper time. That uh, there will be grass for the cattle that will be able to eat and be satisfied. But if we don't, then there will be a very negative world. It may be that because of the negativity, the greed, the selfishness, the concern for oneself rather than for the world, that is one of the reasons that we have the climate threats, the other environmental threats as well. And um, there is a teaching that um, if one does good deeds, that one will be rewarded in the future world, and just the opposite. But that is not really a central focus in Judaism. Okay. And a kind of a parallel question might be, can we return to Eden? Is that something that we can do? Uh -huh. Well, that is one of the goals in all, and that's why we mentioned the Messianic period is like a return to Eden, because just that same way, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the lion will throw with the ox, no one will hurt or destroy in all of God's holy mountain. So we may not be able to quite get there, but I often refer to a book title by um, the author and philosopher Buckminster Fuller, and the title of that book was mm -hmm. Utopia or Oblivion. And that's almost a choice today. Some of the things that we have to do are almost utopian. People say, well, people are just not going to become vegan, etc. Unfortunately, they um, may have a point there, but unless we do things like that, we may have the oblivion, which unfortunately is all too real a possibility today. So we have to move in that direction. We never, may never get fully to Eden, but we have the potential. And fortunately, in recent years, the price for solar energy, for wind energy has gone down. There has been a movement in that direction. People are more conscious of their health, and people are more conscious of the environment. So the, I don't want to paint a completely negative picture. There are some, definitely some positive trends. Hopefully, they'll continue, and we will move to a far better future. Uh, not, God forbid, to uh, a real climate catastrophe. Mm. There are a lot of positive signs. And it Absolutely. does seem to be moving quickly with lots, lots of positive signs. So very encouraging. Yeah. Right. So I wanted to that? just um, notice it's about, yeah, it's about 6 o'clock, getting close to the time that our, it's a different time for each, each of us depending on our time zone, but we're kind of wrapping up the hour of our, of our gathering. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. One is it might be nice to to have the um, kind of closing a prayer that I think Richard was going to share with us. And also, if anybody wants to uh, stay on for a few minutes afterwards, we can continue right. to do the Q&A where we open up the lines. That way, people have a choice if they'd like to um, end uh, at, at, the, at the end of our hour or if they'd like to stay on for a few more minutes and talk and we can hear from some of the people who are on the phone as well. 
okay, um, I'm not like a minister or a rabbi and all, so this is a little new to me. So I've taken a few mm -hmm. notes here and here's a little prayer that I hope uh, people can appreciate. So it goes like this. Dear God, thank you for the wonderful world you have provided us, a world we should look on as Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel indicated, with awe, wonder, and radical amazement. Due to our greed, selfishness, and insensitivity, very unfortunately, we have moved the world to a brink of a climate catastrophe and other potential environmental disasters. Please, God, help us use the great human potential that you have given us to help shift our imperiled planet onto a sustainable path and to a world of peace, justice, and compassion, and environmental sustainability. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Richard. That was beautiful. Thank you so well, thank much. You. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned, what we'll do is continue on with a few questions. And the people in the chat okay. box are, are really uh, also liking your prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. Oh, thank you. Um, oh. So there'll be a little announcement that you may hear as we shift into the Q&A mode. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So if you're on the telephone, there are a few people who are on the phone. If you'd like to ask a question, you can press star six and join us, and you can ask a question directly to Richard. Or if you're oh. online, um, there is a microphone, a little icon of a microphone that's above our pictures on the um, the screen, and you can press that, and that will bring your mic into line with everyone else's here, and we'll be able to hear you. There's also a little icon next to your name under the attendees, and you can also click there to unmute yourself. So if anyone would like to ask a question, um, and of course, you can always uh, ask your question in the chat box. I think I hear somebody. Anybody joining us? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Sure. What's your name? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I can. You. What's your my, name? My name? My name's Leighton Wassum. I'm 82 years young. And here's oh. a basic question. <laughs> yeah, I'm also 82. 82. <laughs> in the Ten mm -hmm. Commandments, oh, Richard, wow. thou shalt not kill. Why doesn't that apply to animals? Or does mm -hmm. it? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Actually, um, the real translation is really thou shalt not murder. Or you can say thou shalt not kill unnecessarily, and that would apply to animals because certainly it's not necessary to kill animals. Because the reason it's not really thou shalt not kill, that would mean, and maybe it would be a great thing, that people would not be able to go to war. They would not be able to defend themselves. You know, mm -hmm. it's a matter of either unfortunately kill or be killed, it would be that. So it's really thou shalt not murder. As I said, uh, that murder means killing unnecessarily, not in self-defense, not in a wartime, not, I'm not a real believer in capital punishment, but of course, if people interpret it that way, then there wouldn't be capital punishment. And by the way, in Jewish tradition, they made it so difficult to have capital punishment that it was, very seldom carried out, but that's really the thing. It's thou shalt not murder. Wouldn't that apply then to what goes on in slaughterhouses? It's certainly premeditated. Yeah, well, I would agree that if you interpret it as thou shalt not kill unnecessarily, then you can say uh, uh, it's certainly contrary. The thing is, there are so many other powerful arguments. Again, the health argument, the compassion for animals in general argument, the environmental, the resource conservation argument, the um, helping the hungry argument, the uh, reducing violence and warfare. So we have many powerful arguments and they should be enough. So uh, sometimes uh, bringing up certain arguments that are not really fully consistent may give others a chance to change the subject because they really can't defend like you say, what happens in slaughterhouses, and even if if care is taken and somehow there's a minimum of pain, which the Jewish laws of Shkita, a ritual slaughter, are designed for. But unfortunately, things are so mass production oriented today 
that it's hard to uh, avoid really uh, cruelty in the slaughterhouses. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Leighton, for asking your question. Thank you. Yeah. I asked one but other thing. In other words, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, what do you think of uh, doing as Gandhi did and Martin Luther King, and that is to peacefully uh, make herself known more as far as the animals are concerned, as far as global warming is concerned? Um, to make myself more well known, I'm not sure I get the idea. I, you know, I wish I could compare myself to Martin Luther King or Gandhi, but each one of us in our own way has to use our abilities to get the word out as much as possible. And by the way, what I am doing to get that word out, and I really appreciate uh, this Lisa and Judy being given this opportunity, trying to get on as many radio programs as possible. I have two blogs where I share information and uh, try to use Facebook and LinkedIn. Thank God, in the age of technology, there's more ways to get messages out, which of course Gandhi didn't have and Martin Luther King didn't have, but they were certainly super, super heroes, and we should all try to emulate them. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, thanks, Layton, for asking your question. Yeah. Um, we're wondering, does anyone else have any questions, either on the phone, you can press star six, or on the computer, as Layton did, you can um, press the microphone icon, and then that will allow you to speak with us. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Hello? Yes, what's your name? Yes, hi. This is, this is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. I, um, hi. I, you know, I definitely heard what um, what you were saying, and I guess for me what um, I heard about what that gentleman was asking is, like, it's sort of like um, about this peaceful demonstration. For me, it's like I, I know that, like when, like, when the gas prices gets really high, I'm always surprised that we can't, like, you know, do something about that, and all of a sudden there's, like, everybody decides that they don't want to be around smoke because smoke really bothers everybody, which is fine. It bothers me, too, and so I'm glad they did that. But this aspect of, to me, that they are the blatant disregard, in my opinion, it's blatant disregard of animals on a global, like, it's, it's very globally, you know, obvious that you have to really you know, make concerted effort to do a peaceful demonstration, like this thing where they're doing clothes with slaughterhouses. You know, I mean, I'm really actually getting more and more how that is the biggest, biggest thing. And I, and I wanted to readdress that because I do think, like, on our own, you know, I actually just lived in the state of Georgia for a little while, and it was very minimal about anything happening there that was in that certain little part of the state. And in Tennessee, it was very minimal in those certain parts of the states. And I know that animal rights is still really growing. But these people that we have here on this call and all the people that are at the conference and just all the organizations, it just seems like in some way that a peaceful, a large peaceful organ movement is possible. And that's what... I got that gentleman was asking. So that's just mm-hmm. me. And I am pose that question again. Right. Okay. No, I agree with you 100% that uh, marches, demonstrations, um, very important, especially since the future of humanity and all life on Earth is at stake in all of this. So um, the question is, can we get enough people out there? I remember some years ago I took part the major, major rally in Washington, D.C. We had buses coming in from all over. I came from New York City, et cetera. So I'm 100% for that and uh, constantly urging people to get more involved, to write letters, to meet with their religious representative, go to the media who's not covering this, 
go to the politicians who generally are ignoring the issue. So uh, I'm 100% for demonstrations if you can get them to be big enough. I remember taking part in a demonstration out in Los Angeles some years ago, uh, demonstrating against uh, something that was trying to show uh, all kinds of exotic animals that were kosher, etc. So I'm all for that. Mm. <laughs> Thank so you. It's just about your like, question. to put that together. I, I guess it's just about, you know, how we can manage to put that together. I think that's just something that we're all going to have to just continue mm -hmm. to align on doing that, like mm -hmm. a, a day or two or a week. And thank you so much, sir. I so appreciate you. I really do. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. Okay, maybe one more question, uh, if there is one. If not, uh, yeah. But I hope, again, Does uh, anyone please, else have please, a question? Contact, please contact me, and uh, if you'd like to work on this, and maybe we can find a way to organize a, a rally, a demonstration. And well, one of the things, by the way, I think there should be a demonstration at a medical professional conference because medical practice today is really malpractice if doctors do not tell their patients of the many health benefits of vegan diets. So, uh, you know, we're letting the religious leaders getting away, get away with things, we're letting the doctors get away, the politicians, the media who's not covering this. So there's plenty of room. But, you know, even if you can't have a demonstration, one thing I've been pushing for many years is a letter writing campaign. So um, I would urge mm -hmm. people to just write letters. That way you are having an impact. They say the letter section is one of the most read parts of the newspaper. So that's something you can do, try to write a letter a month at least. Right. And if enough people do that, it can have more impact than maybe even a demonstration because that's something that people see all the time. By the way, you mentioned I'm on the advisory board of FARM, the Farm Animal Rights Movement, and they have a wonderful thing where they send out letters that, that in the name of people all over the country, and these letters are published, right. they're very well done, like once a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good thing Thanks to do. Thanks for that tip, Richard. Yeah. Great ideas. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else? Hello. Any other questions? Can you hear me? Oh. Hello. Yeah. Yes, we can. I can hear you. Hi. Hi. Who, who this is, is Frank Lane. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear Hi, you. Hi, Frank. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Great. I'm glad I had a problem getting through on the line. I don't know why, but I was talking. I don't think anybody could hear me. But hi, everyone. Thank you for no, 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 no. Hi. being hi. here. <laughs> yeah, great talk, definitely. Richard, thank you so much for your work. It's really appreciated. It's beautiful. I love reading your posts and all the different work that you do. The question that I posed thank you. was how, yes, absolutely. How do we get the armies of religion? Religion is already organized in masses, and they, they have a presence of compassion. It is their dictate. All religions have that dictate. How do we employ that for the vegan objectives, compassion for animals, compassion for the planet? How do we really engage religion? Because that's where the masses are. I think that's where the most amount of demonstration can actually happen, is if we mm -hmm. can engage religion and go to the heart of the matter, literally and figuratively, um, that that's really where we can have the most amount of change. And I'd like your opinion on that. Okay, first, I agree with you 100%, at least. You know, that's what I've been doing, trying for uh, almost 40 years now. That's why I wrote Judaism and Vegetarianism. That's why I wrote Judaism and Global Survival. That's why I wrote Who Stole My Religion, you know, Vitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal on the Peril Planet. And a new edition is due out in a month or so. Uh, anybody that's willing to help promote that uh, would really be appreciated. And uh, that's why I have 200 articles on the internet. That's why I've been speaking at conferences. 
writing letters, responding on email, or you know, on the internet to articles. So I think everybody else could do that. So you know, we said right because the religion has many, many people. You know, that's where people gather every uh, Shabbat, Saturday, and Judaism is Sunday and Christianity Friday with Muslims. So we have that, I agree. And I think more and more religious leaders are moving. There has been some progress, but it's still far, far from what it should be. So this is the uh, $64,000 question. How do we get religious people <laughs> to apply yeah. their own teachings? So again, I've been doing this. Others. Mm -hmm like Lisa and, and Judy for many years with so wonderful books. So we've been doing this, but um, people don't want to change that easily, but they should recognize that if they don't change, we are really, really in trouble. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks, Richard, for answering that question. And that's part of the reason why um, Judy and I want to meet with folks at the Animal Rights Conference, is to actually go in depth into that question. Um, so if anybody right. is available and would like to meet us there, we'll be uh, on Friday at 6 p.m. Um, uh, during the Animal Rights Conference. That will be the opportunity that we'll have to, right. to um, connect and to start to brainstorm how can each of us in our own religious communities, in our own spiritual communities, go back to the places of worship and the people who, who are leaders there and implore and, and uh, encourage them to embrace veganism, at least to introduce the concept that compassion includes compassion for all living beings. And uh, one way to practice that is through uh, our choices and how what we eat and wear and, uh, and things that we purchase. So I, I think Absolutely. that is Absolutely. the million dollar question. Uh, one quick point, I see my, it's, I'm indicating low battery, so if I end, if the screen goes blank, it's because my uh, computer just <laughs> ran out of uh, batteries. I didn't want you to think, I just left. So, but, but thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity. You have a wonderful program. I wish you much continued success. You're both doing a great job, and uh, and you're part of the, the answer. We just need many, 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 many more just like you. So, yes, and thank you, Richard. Oh, so my yeah, pleasure. Really, and good it. night. Okay, best wishes mm -hmm. and good night. Thank you, thank you so much, Richard. Good night, Richard. Yes, thank yes. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. And and we hope that we can actually uh, we're going to do an online version of that meeting that we're doing at the animal rights conference so if we didn't get to uh, hear from you and you're very interested in that particular question that million dollar question of how do we engage other spiritual and religious folks in uh, making this change to veganism or introducing it in some way in their in their congregations and uh, in their uh, then we will put together an online version of that meeting so, oh, yeah, that's great. That's Aaron, fantastic. Give us your, give us your ideas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah give okay. us your ideas. If you and I'd like to be at a conference. Okay. Thank you for the program tonight. Yeah. yeah. Thank oh, you. You're so everybody. welcome. And if everybody, if everyone would like to unmute themselves, we can have a group goodbye because we are a community. And that's one of the things I love about being able to host this is that we are, we are part of a community that has that common bond of compassion for all living beings. So that's why we gather together is to explore these, these questions and, and deepen our understanding of, of the spiritual content involved. And we hope that we'll see you next month. We'll be together uh, on the second Thursday of every month. So please stay tuned for our next uh, our next guest. And if anybody would like to have a group goodbye, feel free to go ahead and... And, uh, and I would just want to say... Yes? Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, yep. Yes. yes, we can. Okay, great, fantastic. Okay. I'm having the vegan potluck this Saturday, so if anybody is in Orange County, please come to the vegan spirituality potluck here in Tustin, California. Yay.
Oh, thank you so much, Frank. Frank is one of our vegan spirituality leaders, one of our organizers, um, and he has a local group that meets every month. And it's the similar uh, idea that gathering together to explore veganism as a spiritual practice. Well, thank you, Frank, for sharing that. That's yeah. really wonderful. And Absolutely. We encourage everybody to go. If you're nearby, be sure to go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And our just so anyone, our just my our last little announcement is that our next our next speaker is going to be uh, Carrie Bagnall, and she's the uh, founder of Jungle Friends Primate Sanctuary. She's actually going to be hosting our next vegan spirituality retreat, and she will be our next guest next month. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We'll have a group goodbye. Oh, goodbye. goodbye, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye.